Hello everyone. A warm welcome to this webinar about the European Standard for Patient Participation in Person-Centered Care. So it's wonderful to see all of you, to, like more than 200 people today, that we can gather together and discuss person-centered care and its future development. I'm Joachim Lien, Professor at the University of Gothenburg, Center and uh, Center Director of the GPCC, the University of Gothenburg Center for Person-Centered Care. Very glad having you here today. And just for your information, last week we could ski here, today snow drops and roof alps peak out of the ground. So I will give a short introduction to the theme and to the, this webinar. Uh, the ability to provide person-centered care is a growing imperative. And the current rise can be seen as a potential and a radically different alternative principle for both the execution and organization of care as compared to the historical principles of healthcare organization without, without for that matter, claiming to be able to solve all challenges associated. And within this broader process of change, the GPCC was launched in 2010, financed by a grant for national strategic research areas. And we strive to contribute to the preventing and reducing of suffering and strengthening the effectiveness of healthcare through person-centered care. And person can, as you well know, be considered a thick concept. And to reach transparency, we have taken the starting point in philosophy and ethics of the person, an explicit ethical approach that combines the relational aspects of collaboration with uh, facilitating structures that could be concretized into practical approaches at the individual, operational, as well as strategic well, levels, and possible to test, evaluate. Uh, through European collaboration, colleagues here at the Centre took the initiative for what ended up in the European Standard for Patient Involvement in Healthcare as minimum requirements for person-centred care. And the European Committee was chaired by Dr. Axel Wolf, an Associate Professor at the Centre, who we'll meet here very soon. And the Swedish committee was chaired by Dr. Carl Sverberg, senior professor and research advisor at the GPCC. And today you will also meet two other experts representing different perspectives on person-centered care and who belong to the group of European colleagues in the committee. And first, Billy Ray Murray from Belgium. He has a biomedical sciences background and is working at the National Consumer Association on Standardization, Health and Security. And he also works for the European Consumer Voice standard for Standardization, which he represented for the development of the European standard. And you will also meet Paul Arne Edvinsen from Norway. He has a degree in law from the University of Oslo and works in Ullesåker municipality as a manager and legal advisor. And he was head of the Norwegian Committee for the Standard Development. And finally, Axel Wolf, an associate professor and researcher at the GPCC. He's also deputy head for digitalization, innovation and utilization at the Institute of Health and Care Sciences at Sargonsk Academy, our university. So this European collaborative achievement is an important milestone for the knowledge utilization as related to person-centered care. And hopefully it will drive the change for greater involvement of patients and the public in healthcare with the capacity to promote health, reduce suffering and strengthen the effectiveness of care. And we are very happy for all of you who are joining us today to hear about the standard, discuss how it can be used to facilitate the introduction of, of and work with and research on person-centered care in a number of different ways by healthcare actors, patient organizations, researchers, businesses and others. So a warm welcome to everyone and Axel, the screen is yours. So thank you so much. And um, hi everyone, my name is Axel Wolf, and I will be your host for this seminar. And I will also um, start to share my screen with you now. Um, and uh, before I start with a brief uh, introduction, I will um, want to inform you that uh, this meeting is recorded. 
and we will send out uh, the meeting or the video of the meeting uh, or the, the, the seminar uh, within two to three weeks to you that participate in the, in the seminar, which, because it's always go also going to be texted. Um, you are able to chat with us, so please, if you have the, the, the next uh, one and a half hours, please use the chat function and I will look at the chat and we will uh, take the questions after the presentations of uh, the free speakers. So each of us will present uh, our different perspectives uh, for about 15 to, to, to 20 minutes. And then afterwards, we are going to, uh, to try to uh, have a dialogue uh, from the question that, that arose from you in the audience. So please feel free to the box of Zoom. Um, so if we start um, with a brief introduction about the standard, uh, which uh, um, focuses on the uh, minimum requirement of patient involvement in, in person-centered care, um, and uh, it's, uh, um, it's, it's uh, help for, for future healthcare. If you are interested in more info about the standard or, or research about person-centered care or, or tools for person-centered care, please also visit the GPCC homepage. You see it here in the bottom right corner. Um, it's both in Swedish and English, and there you can find both uh, research studies and um, um, information about education and also tools that have been developed. Um, if you look at the standard, and it's a European standard um, by SEN, so the European Committee for Standardization, uh, you can find the standard at SEN uh, and SEN TC, so TC is the Technical Committee 450, Patient Involvement in Person-Centered Care, and if you visit the page you will see that there is um, uh, where the arrow is, you, you see the sales point. And if you uh, go into sales point, every country's contact with every country's national organization body will, will, will be there. And you can both contact the, the specific country to, to ask more about the standard uh, and get hold of it also. So why a standard? It's because we see that it's good to support and facilitate uh, standardization of patient involvement both within and between different healthcare settings, between countries, of course, also, which also could facilitate, um, for example, in research or research methodology within and between countries, if you, for example, want to make a European uh, project within different aspects of person-centered care and patient involvement. A standard is internationally agreed by experts, so uh, it's a consensus-driven approach. So this is important, and I will come back to that also. And even more important is that the standard, it stipulates the base level, uh, so the minimum requirement of patient involvement, but it shows what you should reach and hopefully also go beyond that, of course, but the organization and the provider that uses the standards uh, knows how to reach it. So the standard stipulates what's to reach, but how you and your organization wants to reach it is up to you. If you look at the different uh, national and international bodies, uh, here I have an example from Sweden. So the Swedish Institute of Standardization, SIS, then you have on a European level, and this is where the standard is right now, on a European level, you have the European Committee for Standardization, so SAM, and then you also have um, international level, which is the International Organization of Standardization. So this standard is on a European uh, level. Goals and challenges. Uh, the goal was to create a European platform for person-centered care, and the first instance here was to create a standard uh, that ensures the minimum requirement of patient involvement in healthcare and also person-centered care. But there are also possibilities within this European platform um, to make further in initiatives in the field if you want to standardize something else also, which is good for patient involvement and person-centered care. 
The purpose was to influence the structures and processes that benefit both patients and healthcare services. It was not a purpose to standardize or restrict the practice of medicine or impact guidelines, for example. And challenges that we have seen uh, is also that this is a controversial area. Uh, healthcare is often, uh, or mainly I would say, professionally controlled. Um, but also that there are differences between uh, countries in Europe, uh, how far they have come and the distance they come regarding patient involvement, person-centered care, et cetera. want to show you some different uh, frameworks or, or concepts around patient-centered care or person-centered care. And there is a different, of course, but to see these are three different frameworks. Um, they share at least um, similarities also, but there, there are differences, of course, also. But one of the main differences, even if all of them want to uh, emphasize the patient's role in their care, um, one uh, difference that you could make, say, is that patient-centered care is more about putting the patient in the center and identifying the needs of the patient, which of course is important. However, we think that person-centered care is about using the patient and the patient's expert knowledge as a partner to involve the patient both in his and her care, but also see the resources enabling uh, the patient voices and the person's voices in improving healthcare. So that is a difference in, in looking at the needs of a patient or seeing the person as a key stakeholder in the team. And this is uh, one of the definition uh, provided by, by Professor Inger Ekman and um, colleagues from the, the Gatlinburg University Center of Person Center Care um, oh, and I've seen that my, my uh, presentation has stopped, so I will start it again. I'm sorry about this. Let's try if it works again. Um, so let's try one more time. Do you see my presentation now? Yes, perfect. Great. I'm so sorry for this. Let's see where we were. Uh, I think that we try to start. Um, so let's see. Do you see a picture with the patient involvement in healthcare? Uh, yes, perfect. Thank you, uh, Laura. Um, so there is a difference. Um, and that's why we, we also emphasize person centered care. Uh, to nourish the relationship and the partnership. Um, and in that sense, to try to operationalize this, we, um, there is a concept or a framework done by Professor Inger Ekman and colleagues from the University of Gothenburg Center of Person Centered Care, um, where it looks, like, uh, looks at both how you initiate the partnership, and there you have the patient's narratives and story, and uh, by this, you initiate the narrative. Uh, and in order to work the narrative, you combine the patient's narrative and story with your and the healthcare team's expertise and to share uh, the decision making to create a health and care plan. And then, of course, you also need to further work this uh, through documentation and revision of documentation. And um, studies in person-centered care in different healthcare settings have shown significant positive effects uh, by partnering up with the patient um, and his or her relatives. Um, it has reduced uncertainty in illness, improved self-efficacy. On organizational level, it has reduced hospital stays, um, improved discharge processes, and in that sense also had a huge impact on uh, cost of care. Um, studies have also shown a reduction in number of hospitalization, 
uh, and also very important is uh, the studies in, in um, a home care environment and dementia care, for example, has shown improved working environment and uh, satisfaction uh, from, the, from the healthcare professional side also. So you see that there are a number of positive uh, benefits by working in a person-centered care approach in different healthcare settings. So even if uh, many of these effects here are um, hospital-based, there are studies on, on primary care settings, for example, and, and home care also. So we talked about uh, uh, the partnership and patient involvement at that it's important to see it as, a, as an important aspect of the future in healthcare. And, and uh, Professor Len mentioned that it's important to see it as an ethics of care also. But you also need to be able to have tools and structures to work in everyday um, settings with patient involvement and person-centered care. So that's why a standard is important to facilitate and support the everyday working uh, with these concepts. As you see here, it is a process, a, a long process to, to make a standard. Um, and on a European level, it started 2016 and ended with this first standard in 2020. There are 34 national members uh, that both participate, comment and vote. And it's also important that it is the voting is based on, on weighted votes. So every country, so depending on the population size, they have more or less. Uh, weighted votes. And they're also actively involved organizations. So uh, we had the European Trade Union configuration at TÜRK and uh, also ANEC, the European Consumer Voice and Standardization. And Billy Ray Murray will, uh, will talk from ANEC after my presentation also. And the standard was approved uh, in, in June 2020 as a European standard. The scope of the standard was to um, specify the minimum requirement that enables patient involvement in healthcare services with the aim to create favorable structural conditions for person-centered care. So this is the minimal requirement. Um, we hope that organization will also go beyond it, of course. Um, it facilitates and assists patient empowerment and partnership. And focusing on the patient's narrative and story or narratives and story, shared decision making and information sharing and documentation. It's intended to be used both before, during and after the care episode, but also as a, on a strategic level for, for example, research, development of quali uh, quality assurance and improvement, education, uh, supervision and certification, of course, also. If we go briefly through the structure, and I know that the, the, the other speakers will go a little bit more into detail on that, is that the standard uh, contains of four main parts. And it's the patient's narrative and experience of illness, the partnership, uh, the documentation and care plan, and also patient and public involvement in management, organization, and policy. And each of these parts or chapters are, uh, have requirements in two categories or subcategories on the organizational level and of a, on a point of care level, so to speak. And the standard also comes with an appendix with uh, case descriptions in order to, to illustrate how you could work with uh, the different requirements and a case description from a, diff a lot of different contexts. This is an example, and, and this is just to highlight you. So every part or chapter starts with a general introduction. Here you see patient's narrative and experience of illness. And then you come to requirements, and the requirements are divided into organizational level, uh, how you can work with, for example, here patient's narrative, and also a point of care level. But we will come back to some examples in the, in the next talk. To summarize, um, our goal was to create uh, a European standard for patient involvement, and this was achieved in uh, June 2020. 
And now, of course, the work is not done. We need to see how this standard can facilitate and support increased patient involvement throughout Europe. The standard stipulates the base level. So it stipulates what should be done. The organization decide how should be done. It's applicable for different services in healthcare, including self-care, um, but of course also can be used in social care, uh, but we have focused on healthcare here. You can start anytime with the standard, uh, maybe with internal audits. Uh, if you want to use external audits, that's also interesting. Um, there are also certification bodies here in Sweden, for example, we have started the discussion with the, with the Swedish uh, national accreditation body in order to accredite uh, organizations that want to be certification bodies, but that depends on the different countries. It is a consensus driven approach and approach, so this is very important. Um, so that's why it took so long to make this standard. It was approved, like I said, in June 2020. And in Sweden, uh, GPCC has made it possible to access the Swedish version as a read uh, version online for free for two years. Um, in other countries, it looks a little bit different. So that's why you, uh, if you are interested, go into the, the webpage on, on SANTC450 and look for the contact details on your country and, uh, and uh, get some more information from there. Um, so now I think that we uh, stop here. Uh, I'm sorry for the technical troubles, but I think that I'm also are, uh, running a bit late here. So I will stop sharing now. Uh, and um, um, we'll um, uh, turn off my mic and camera and um, uh, give a warm welcome to our next speaker which is uh, Billy Ray Murray von der Neck. Hello, everyone. So I'll try to share my presentation. Um, maybe not at the end. We'll begin with the beginning. That's better. So does everyone see it? If there's a problem, don't hesitate to to interrupt me. So, uh, hello, I'm Bill Ray, and first I would like to thank Axel and the Gothenburg University for uh, hosting this webinar and uh, allowing, allowing me to speak for the consumers. Speaking about consumers, uh, for what I would like for, to explain is how we uh, consumer organizations uh, do use the standards, because of course we don't sell products, we don't sell services, so we don't have a direct uh, application of the standard per se, but our objective is really, as you can show, um, as, as, as you can see on the pictures, um, our goal is to create an environment that is safe for the consumer. And so per, for person-centered care, it's to improve the person, the, the person's experience and health outcome. So um, that's really how we use it. It's a more like a lobby tool for us but it's a really important tool since, as Axel's, or, uh, Axel already said, it's based on the consensus and uh, is destined to be spread on uh, several levels. So why is it important for us? Well, you might answer that there are, as Axel already showed, there are many um, advantages. So I'll go quickly on these. First is better health outcomes. Uh, reduce cost both for the health system and the consumer. And finally, it's a uh, decreased uh, confidence and resilience for the health system. And I think that recent events with the pandemic showed us how important it is uh, to have a resilient health system. Now, why is it important for the consumers? Well, I think it's a real shift in philosophy how, of how we see healthcare. Now, the picture you have now is a bad example uh, that happened, that may happen a little bit too often. It's not a generality, of course, but that's what we wanted to avoid. And this standard, uh, its goal uh, is to make a real shift from uh, 
those kind of bad situations to a place where there's a real team and a real partnership between the healthcare services, the healthcare professionals, and the patients. Um, why are we involved in this standard? Well, you might say that the answer is in the title, and I agree. Uh, it seems uh, logical that the first concern can have a word in the conception of the, the standard. But also, we really try to bring the, all the complexity of the consumer view, such as uh, its perceptions of the disease, its consents, its understanding of uh, the treatment, the diversity of the situations, the, of the culture, the issues. Uh, of course, here you come from many different countries. You, you and I might not have the same conception of an efficient healthcare and so on. So that was the goal of the, the standard, is to include all this complexity in simple requirements that everybody can apply. And also, as we are a consumer organization, uh, socioeconomic issues are really important for us because as you probably know, um, healthcare is often linked to the social, uh, social economic conditions. So, what, what is in the standard? First, you have a series of requirements, including, uh, of including how to make an efficient partnership between all the team and the patients. But you also have, as I said, and as, as Axel already said, uh, the inclusion of the, all the complexity of the person, which is not only its nar narrative, well, it's of course the narrative, but is also how, uh, how does the patient feel about its treatment? Is he afraid? Is there any problem that is not really linked to health problems? And so on. And there's also a series of um, requirements about the planning and how to organize a structure to have an efficient patient-centric care. Because if you don't give the professional the means to apply the patient-centered the patient care by allowing time, by making routines, by including it in the planning, of course, it will never work. So it, even for a consumer, it's our in best interest that everybody has uh, all the advantages possible to, to apply the standard. Now, I will spend the rest of the time maybe uh, to through one example, uh, which is in the standard. So it's a little bit of an insight of the content. Uh, so it's from the annexes. Here, here we have a patient with periodontitis and needing two fillings. So he goes to a dentist and the dentist uh, listen to him, but he also proposed him a treatment that may be harmful, although the patient doesn't want any anesthesia. The dentist agrees and treated him. So uh, there seemed to be no problem. But after several months, the, uh, the gum is bleeding and the teeth are not going better, which is causing uh, financial costs both for the consumer and for the health system. A uh, month of suffering and so on. So clearly, the situation is quite bad. So what did happen? Uh, here, the fault is not on the medical field because this was the right treatment. It was the right thing to do, but it didn't go the right way. So what happened? The patient went for another dentist who read the standard and who had time to implement all the patient-centered care uh, requirements. And it became really quickly clear that the problem was due to the absence of anesthesia because the muscles of the patient were so tense due to the suffering that uh, the treatment did simply not work. So. Uh, what did the second dentist? He took the time to speak with the patient, to obtain his narrative, to document it, to uh, see why he doesn't want any anesthesia. And he discovered that the patient had a feel of needles and of injections. So uh, the, 
that's a, a simple fact that the first dentist did not uh, discover. And you can see now how easy it is to apply some re basic requirements, but how, also how easy to, um, to, figure, to, to, um, to not see basic facts that could help for the treatments. So the dentist took time also to, um, to apply several requirements, such as why is the patient seeking care, seeking care? Here it's obviously to get better and stop suffering. How is he feeling with the care process? So they talked about the fear of needles. He explained him what were the whereabouts of the treatment and why it didn't work in the first place. And after some discussion and some uh, shared uh, emotional feelings, uh, the patient was, uh, was able to accept a first try with anesthesia just to see how it would go. And finally, it went better. And through all, through, uh, all the treatments, the, the dentist kept an active communication to keep the trust of the patient and to not to go back to the previous refused the anesthesia and uh, causing all the troubles we already see. And so with this simple example, we can see how uh, building a partnership, partnership between here simply one person to another uh, can make an efficient uh, patient-centered care approach. Now I want to come with another example that I made up. So this one is not in standard, but uh, I made it up just to illustrate how it is uh, easily applicable in uh, most situations. So, uh, and I also, I also uh, like to uh, illustrate some health trends, such as the uh, growing autonomy of patients, as you know, uh, patients tend to spend less and less time in hospital rooms. Uh, also, I would like to address e-health, uh, chronic disease that are more prevalent every day within our uh, populations, and the uh, aging population with all its specificities. And also, uh, some unexpected circumstances, circumstances such as uh, pandemics. Uh, and here is the case. It's a 75 years old woman with a recent but benign cerebral vascular incident and who is diagnosed with colorectal cancer needing treatment. So it's not, uh, it's not really worrying, but she really needs treatment. So, and what is the best person centered care scenario? Well, first you have to get the patient's narrative. So uh, you learn, you might learn that she's living alone at home and she fears uh, to come to the hospital due to the pandemic because she comes uh, with the bus. And as you may know, the bus is, uh, is a place where you have risk of contamination such as the hospital. So for her, it would be really good that she has, to, uh, if she has to come the less often to the hospital you can get the patient's motivation, such as autonomy and home care. So you learn that for her, it will be a really good solution to be treated at home if possible. Uh, so together you present uh, the different options and you start a shared decision-making. So you make, you make sure that the patient really understands the whereabouts of the treatment, the different options that are at hand. And based on uh, this common understanding, you can elaborate a treatment plan with her consent. So, um, so for example, if I, have, if I have, for example, here, you might start a program where if she can get treatment at home. Uh, I don't know how it is in other countries, but I know in Belgium, there was a project uh, to implement it, to implement it. And so it would be applicable. And uh, during the whole treatment process, you can install routines uh, at organizational levels to uh, facilitate the communication, uh, such as, for example, now with the uh, numeric tools, you can have a teleconference and a teleconsultation, the teleconsultations with the patients. 
Uh, however, you must not forget that she's not that young, so uh, she's her numeric skill skills might not be the best. So um, one solution, for example, is uh, if there is someone uh, spending time at her home, for example, for help uh, to help with uh, social issues, with uh, just cleaning the house, for example, you might contact the organization and propose for the person to spend some time for, uh, to help the patient to get familiar with some tools such as telecommunications. And finally, uh, as the patient is no longer in the hospital, it's really important to have a continuum for the person-centered care. For example, you might call her uh, generalist, generalist uh, physician to speak about the treatment, to see if there is uh, other issues that you might not know, uh, and also to keep an open, an open and efficient communication. Those are really important issues. So again, you can see how all these requirements may seem ba quite basic when we say it, but uh, as I showed with my first example, it's also really easy to skip them. And that's the real goal of the standards, to, uh, to my point, is that it really helps to implement each of them and to have a really efficient uh, patient-centered care approach. So in conclusion, uh, yeah, as I said, it's a, really a shift in the healthcare approach. And uh, these standards uh, provides minimal requirements. That means, as Axel already said, that you can obviously go further. I give some uh, insights on how you can manage uh, patient-centered care with more specific issues, but that's really uh, to uh, your responsibility to know how to do it. To do it. Uh, and as I see it, the standard is really a good toolbox So I hope that many of you will be interested in uh, reading it and applying it in your, each of your fields of specialty. And on these words, I would like to thank you all for your attention and I see you afterward for these discussions. Thank you. So I will try to stop the presentation and maybe the next speaker can come out. Yes. Can you can you hear me? I hear you. Yes. Yeah. Great. Then I'll try to share my presentation. Okay. But you have, you have to stop yours before I can do that. Um. Okay. Like that. Great, thank you. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Um, like Axel said, uh, my name is Paul Arnett Vinson. Um, uh, or it was Joachim who said that. Uh, I'm from Norway. Um, I work in uh, Ullensaki municipality, which is just north of Oslo. Um, and I have uh, been working in this sector for almost 20 years and um, I have a, a degree from law. Um, so that's obviously a part of how I see things. Um, but I think that's a, a plus in this, uh, in this setting. And um, I was uh, fortunate enough to, to lead the Norwegian Mirror Committee in, this, in, the, uh, in the work with this standard. So I'm very, uh, very happy to be here today and to uh, share some of my considerations. And um, now I'll try to try to share the screen with you. Yes. Can you see the presentation now? Yes, I hope you can do that. I don't see the chat right now. Um, so um, 
I think I hope it it works. Yes. Um, for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to speak uh, uh, about three things. For, first of all, what is the problem with um, implementing patient involvement from my perspective? Uh, two, I would like to say some of the to say something about some Norwegian aspects which underlines the the need for such a document like this, such a standard, because uh, it's it's I think it's um, really important. Uh, it's an important part of, it, of of things we need to do in the future. Um, third, I will see, say something about uh, implementing the standard. So, um, if you go if you go back in time some decades, uh, the, the the situation was like this: when you went to a doctor, you as a patient went to a doctor, he examined you, and maybe you met a nurse, and she took some tests and and something like that. And after the doctor has uh, evaluated what your situation were, you were uh, presented a, a offer offered a treatment. What it was not much to discuss. It's more or less like uh, what he has uh, uh, evaluated was the thing you were offered. Um, throughout, uh, especially from the 70s and the years uh, onwards, it became became quite obvious that uh, this was not a situation that uh, we wanted to have. We wanted some change uh, on this uh, particular way of doing things. Um, this way of doing things was changed a couple of decades ago, and in Norway, the change took place at the turn of the millennium. Now, the patient's needs were put in the center and services were connected in relation to this. The services were to help determine what was important to the patient and were forced to collaborate to ensure an interdisciplinary offer. In this way, uh, the patient's autonomy was significantly strengthened. This was completely in line with ideas that had developed since the 70s, like I said, uh, like I said, where patients were to be involved more in their own treatment. Uh, it, it was the, the thought was that uh, the patient knew, knew himself best and had to be able to be more involved in such a process. So uh, we had a big, big change. Um, so the history shows us, that, <clears throat> shows us that we have moved from like a, a large degree of voluntary services and private services to a more public responsibility. Um, and I think this is really important because this shows us that uh, through the years we have seen a strengthening in autonomy, in quality of services and the use of consent in all parts of the, the treatment process. So what can we say is the problem here? Well, I will say that uh, fundamentally, uh, this uh, way of doing things that we had before, we don't want it like that again. And uh, to make sure that doesn't happen again, we have to make big changes. And we have made big changes. Um, and uh, patient involvement is a very important part of it. And it's also important that uh, one of the biggest problems is that um, we have a mismatch of power in, in relations. Uh, for example, the doctor example that I mentioned earlier, um, it's quite obvious that the doctor who has the, the means and the services that the patient needs uh, has a much greater power over the patient uh, than the patient had the other have the other way. The, in in many cases, the patient is a lifelong need in need of these services. So this can uh, the patient involvement structure and this uh, standard can help uh, even out this mismatch. And in the broader picture, we can also say that a demo good democratic society is based on values like information, credibility, trust, and co influence. So, uh, all in all, this uh, builds up as a good uh, argument for, for the, the, the standard. And uh, uh, yes. Uh, I will mention quite fast some issues from Norway that's important because I think um, patient involvement is a part is a big part of uh, develop the development we have to do uh, for the years to come because we have a big challenge on our on our way. 
uh, uh, lots of, uh, of reports from the government has shown this and also found something that's also referred in the standard, the UN report on world population aging, uh, that says that we have uh, a huge, huge shift in the needs in the years to come. The, the population gets older and therefore we will have more needs than today. At the same time, we can say that uh, both Norway and other countries will have a, uh, will will have a big issues with uh, doing things the same way that we do today. We cannot do that. It's not something. Uh, it's possible. So we have to change uh, a lot. Um, and in one report from 2014, the Minister of Health in Norway uh, launched his ideas for a new health care service. Um, and his uh, major point is that we have to change the healthcare system from being the employee's domain to be the patient's domain. Uh, it, we, must, we must build what he says is the patient's health service. The basic idea was that if the patient who is at the center of what's going on, the patients will get better services at the right time and in the right place. I guess this is pretty well known for the most of you, but um, it's uh, very nice that it's been underlined like this. There were some other uh, things said in the in this report. Uh, this report that's very important, and as you can see, this all builds up to patient involvement. Uh, what does the patient need on a sub uh, on a subject level? What does the patient mean uh, about his own situation? Um, yeah, and I think this is important too. It says something about uh, really getting to know the patient's uh, story. And uh, to be able to do that, we have to use what we all now know is, uh, is uh, what is important to you conversation. Um, which is something we have used for a time for for quite some time in in um, in uh, the municipality and and uh, it's getting quite known as a good tool. Um, to uh, what we discuss in Norway, it can be summarized with this figure. It shows that there are two fundamental conditions that must be clarified before looking more closely at what measures and services can be implemented. Here we see that the starting point is, of course, that a person must need help, uh, which at least uh, has to mean that it doesn't go over by itself. And then one must discuss what the person, uh, what this person experiences as needs. And here, patient involvement comes in as a central factor in the work in all stages in relation to its central significance. So, um, summarized, um, I will say that uh, what we are dealing with in Norway has a lot to do with uh, patient involvement. And in some documents, it even says that um, it is emphasized that patient involvement must govern the work. And here, I believe the standard will be helpful in achieving uh, this. Yes, so uh, the rest of the presentation, I will talk about implementing the standard. <clears throat> uh, in 2020, I worked on a project in Ullensaker municipality where we examined how we will bring about a change in the sector in line with the needs that come in the future. We had workshops and interviews with employees and partners and relatives and patients. We went in depth on what it's like to be in the different roles and tried to find out what is the most important to them. There were many statements that emphasized what we have already talked about today, but there was one statement in particular from a patient that I noticed. There was one who talked about what was most important to him in meeting with the healthcare services in the municipality. And he said, what is important to me is that I am important to you. It impressed us all, especially because it was so direct, uh, but also because it was an expression of that if the trust is in place, then the rest is relatively uh, easy. And for me, uh, this has become a mantra. If I manage to create trust uh, throughout the interaction with a patient, 
and I have for the most part succeeded with patient involvement, like I see it. Uh, some time ago, I read something about implementing changes in an organization, and I, I felt it was all right to say something about it today because this is this is important. Um, uh, it said that if you want to make a change on something in an organization, there are three parts that are very uh, very important. First, culture and values. Third, uh, second and third subject and technical matters. And and uh, uh, they uh, they vary in importance, and of course, culture culture and values are the most important of them all. And this is super uh, uh, super important to remember when we try to change something. That first and foremost, we have to find ways to 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 uh, do something with the culture and and the values that drives the culture. Professor Paul Gilbronson from the University of Oslo uh, co-authored an article in 2016 about this subject. And uh, it was a very good article. I really recommend it. Uh, uh, recommend you to read it. And um, you can see Paul on the picture here. And I found two things he said that's very important and that re relates to, to the cultural part that I just talked about. As you can see, patient involvement is not just an exchange of information, but the establishment of a relationship so that one understands the patient's situation and needs. Patient participation involves touching on existential aspects of the patient's life, security, vulnerability, autonomy, and trust. That was very, very, uh, uh, that was a very good article. And, and these pinpoints are very important, I think. Uh, I, I think. Uh, so, um, based on that, we can say that uh, uh, the communication between healthcare personnel and a patient is the essential part here. And, and I also found some principle of health ped pedagogy, uh, which is uh, a good, uh, a good uh, working uh, principles to implement on a daily basis. Um, and as I'm going to say a little bit afterwards, um, making this principle a part of, of um, a checklist is a good way to start. Uh, further about implementing the standard. Um, in Ullensake, we have implement, implemented a number of measures to implement the standard. We have mapped what employees themselves perceive as is the challenge with, the, with patient involvement. And we have anchored the work in the management. We have also had a pilot for 10 weeks for new patients where we have tested what is important to you conversation in the early stages of the contact with the patient. This were patients that had long-term needs, so it was uh, it was uh, good cases to work with to to test out uh, this. Uh, we are now preparing for new checklists and changes to our procedures, procedures and guidelines. We are also trying to establish a collaboration with other nearby municipalities in order to perhaps be able to manage and establish a similar practice in our part of the country. We also want the regional hospital to join in. Since culture and values, like I said, uh, are so important to bring about change, the most important thing must be to do activities that support this. Culture is what we do that no one questions. Thus, patient involvement must be made an integral part of activities at all levels, both at the patient level, service level, and as a, at the systemic level. It's not an easy task and requires that you take many, many measures over a long period of time until the change settles in. I believe the standard will help in this regard since it is focused on specific areas, areas where it's, it is important to make an effort. The four areas it mentions are very good areas as it is easy to identify with and easy to understand the importance of. Furthermore, it is important to ensure that all levels of the organization are involved in the work, including the management, who must talk warmly about this as much as possible. What the leaders focus on, you get more of, as it is, says, as it, it is said. The technical side of the implementation is about making it 
uh, as easy as possible to do the job for those who meet their patients, including updated procedures, effective checklists, and time to do the job in a good way. And here, as elsewhere, one should be able to measure progress. For example, by measuring patients, user, satisf user satisfaction, and staff's perception of improvement, of improvement in quality. Yes, uh, lastly, I will say that uh, all these five uh, issues for us in the Norwegian Committee, and we uh, proceeded to discuss how can we take the standard and even try to operationalize opera, yes, make it more usable. Sorry for that. Um, and uh, it, um, we ended up making our guidance for the, uh, the uh, standard. Um, first and foremost, to explain a little bit more what the standard said, um, but also to make sure that uh, we have, a, we, we, have a, we draw parallels to Norwegian law and guidelines. So we could uh, show that this is in, in, uh, in the right context. And also we made some checklists that could easily be take, put into use to make uh, the standard work as, as fast as uh, possible. Yes, uh, that, was, uh, that was my consideration about this. Um, thank you for, for listening. And uh, that was it for, for now. So great, Paul, and thank you for your presentation. And um, uh, now we've had uh, three presentations from three different perspectives. So I would like the, the panelists, so Billy Ray and Paul, and also you, Akim, to, to start your cameras, because now we have uh, some time, um, 20 minutes, for, for questions. And I, I will take the questions as they came into the chat. Uh, and um, the first question that, that I want to ask is from uh, Georgios uh, Sokrafakis, and he wonders about the role of person-centered care in palliative care. And uh, I would like Professor uh, Ulien to, to elaborate a little bit on that, please. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, so, yeah, palliative, I think it has a high relevance. That's the first part of it. And, but in particular, since palliative care is a field or speciality of, of healthcare, where you can, the notion of the patient or family members as uh, persons has been kind of since, since the very beginning, but it's mostly taken for granted. So I, I'm quite sure that the person-centered care approach could provide a structure. For, for what usually is taken for granted them. And in particular in ways uh, we are now um, want to, to achieve integrated care. That palliative care is an approach that could be applied across specialities. Uh, and, um, uh, and it's kind of hopefully could also contribute to a less of a less dramatic change in the way the patients and family members perceive practices and actions by health providers so that they have already been asked what matters to you very early on in the, in the disease trajectories. So I think it's, and it could for sure strengthen the partnership. And in addition, the, the, it's quite rare with real, truly patient and public involvement in management organization and policy of policy care. Well, thank you, Joachim. Uh, Billy Ray or Paul, do you have anything to, to add? regarding palliative care, for example? No? I quite agree yep. with uh, what has just been said. <laughs> so, and, and there came also some questions both by Magali Coldify and uh, Amy Clothworthy, and they ask about um, the requirements and challenges for, for different um, for patients with different diseases or, or symptoms, mentioned mental health field, for example, but also people with cognitive decline. And um, as we mentioned, th this is a general standard uh, in that sense for patient involvement to, to find the, the minimal requirement. Um, 
and in the appendix and the cases there are uh, there is a case for example for patients that suffer from psychosis uh, but it's about a patient with with aphasy after a stroke and even if it's not uh, exactly for cognitive decline um, or or the the broader field of mental health the, the appendix and the cases are there to illustrate um, uh, but once again, like I, I, I said before, the standard is, is general. It says what to achieve, but not how. So in that sense, it's also important. Uh, and I want to ask Paul a little bit about how, how have you worked and do you have any suggestion for the, for the audience? But how, how do we adapt the standard? Do you have any ideas there or in the implementation of it in different contexts, of course? Um, yes, um, um, uh, uh, first and foremost, we have to be practical, uh, I think. Uh, I come from a, uh, um, every day that's a need, that needs to be practical in what we do, and uh, I think that uh, we, we need to uh, uh, implement uh, uh, um, uh, where we work uh, after a process of talking with everybody involved where we are how can we uh, raise the uh, raise the stand uh, raise the um, level of patient involvement all over but uh, but i see from my perspective we have also no, we also need to stop and, and ask what do people think is the problem and and i think uh, based on what i have learned the the that question has a lot of answers, different answers. So uh, we need to do it practical. We need to say that this is, uh, has four parts. We need to uh, establish a way to hear the patient's history. Uh, we need to uh, make sure there are plans all the way. And, and these four parts of the standards is very important and, and make sure that we start by implementing those four. Uh, but, it, but, but because there's also a risk that we make it bigger than it needs to be. Uh, and I, I think that's a part of the issue of not uh, uh, managing to, to make patient involvement as good as it should be. Thank you. Uh, Billy Ray, do you want to add? Mm, yes, maybe. I, maybe it's the right moment to introduce the fact that the standards also include um, some mentions of uh, patient proxies. Uh, I think, for example, for patients who are uh, suffering for really severe uh, mental disease, uh, who might not be able to uh, provide a clear narrative and to make clear decisions. Of course, this is very complicated uh, ethical questions, but uh, I think that the standards might be of help because, we, as Paul said, it provides basic uh, requirements that can be applied. and. That's probably the, the the frontier where the the personal interaction with the patients and the patient proxies and the specific situations of each person uh, for the moment is left to the to the appreciation of the professionals because the, we assume they know best uh, and still even though it's sometimes complicated to interact with someone who has a mental illness, disease or troubles, it's important just to try, just to try to have a communication, just to try to involve them the maximum possible. And uh, I think if you do that, that would only be, um, uh, that would only result in a better outcome in the end. Great. And I, I think that it's also important, as you said, that, uh, Different countries have, have different also uh, legal systems, of course, and, and one aspect that is important, and uh, Paul mentioned it also, that a standard is never above the law. Uh, so the national law uh, is, is above of it. Uh, but in Sweden, for example, I, I can take the example of Sweden, we had had that the patient involvement has been part of the, of the Swedish healthcare law for a very long time, but it still hasn't been easy uh, to really take it down to the to the floor to facilitate it to practice it and there uh, we hope that this standard can be a, a, a help to facilitate uh, in order to improve and to make sure that the basis 
So this is a European standard about the minimum requirement of, of patient involvement. Uh, you hopefully go way above it also in order to achieve what the law uh, also stipulates already. And mm -hmm. in the discussion we had with different European countries throughout the consensus driven approach, uh, many participants said that we have it already in the law, but it still has been hard to, to implement it. And I mean that the benchmarking of different patient involvement and patient participation and person-centered care measurements throughout Europe shows that uh, there is still a lot to do. Some countries are better, and we got a question about, uh, about this in the, in the panel also. Um, uh, about uh, good countries, for example, uh, Ignas Rubikas asked, do we have any good examples of countries that, that are, um, are, are good examples of countries uh, stating mental health here and PCC in Europe? Um, I leave the uh, question up here for, for any one of you who, who uh, maybe can give an answer if you have any countries that you've seen are, are better in the in the field of mental health and PCC? No, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I wished I had uh, I have uh, heard about that too because uh, that's very sought our uh, after. So, but I'm sorry. Yeah, it's really difficult to uh, to answer that uh, because uh, everyone has the, the different definition of that person patient centered care, and it's quite well the. the um, the, the philosophy may not be new, but the, the way we talk about it and the way we want to implement it is quite new. So it's still difficult to say, uh, oh, there is a perfect example. Exactly. And that's uh, coming back to, to the question that also was raised by Sebastian Lindblom, um, yeah. saying that um, much of what we heard today is, is already known about person-centered care and patient involvement. And I think that that is the is the is the thing with the standard that it, it's nothing new. It's just how you could implement and work with the with the consensus about patient involvement on a on a daily pra uh, practice uh, bedside, but also in in patient and public involvement issues, uh, such as policy making or improvement project and such. And hopefully the standard can provide a facilitation for that in the different areas. Um, in that sense. Um, I want to ask you, um, we, we got one question from um, Sandra Udigek uh, about, um, and I think that I will uh, ask uh, Paul about it because it's more in the, in the legal space. Uh, do, have you heard anything or have you seen any evidence that lit lit uh, litigation has, has decreased uh, with person-centered care or increased patient involvement? Good, good question. Um, no, not really. I, I haven't had any evidence of, of, uh, of that that I have uh, read about or are experienced. Um, um, no, no, not really. <laughs> I don't know what more to say about it, but because you say it's a legal question, and of course uh, I could say a lot about it, but uh, um, I, I um, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, yeah, there's an ongoing process that's been always going on in our sector, and 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 what's special about our about our sector is that the uh, the incremental changes in our sector are very, very small uh, and opposite to other sectors uh, like finance and other, which are big changes every year. And, uh, and, and I think that the, one of the most important thing here is to, to realize what is going on, what is changing. And, uh, and, uh, and PCC is a big thing. Um, yeah, sort of an answer. Yeah, thank you. Um... <laughs> But it's also, I mean, this is also a great opportunity for us to, to think more about the, the, the questions that are raised in this, this seminar, of course. Um, yes. And I think one uh, question raised by Filippo Ventura going to, to the next question is, is of course, um, a question that is very, very, very hot topic about digital technology, not at least uh, that has been uh, uh, accelerated throughout the COVID-19 crisis. And I, I want to ask Billy Ray, 
now that we have a, um, a standard for minimal requirement, um, how can we go above it and beyond it? And how do you see the role of e-health and digitalization for the, for the patient in that sense? Well, there, uh, if we stay in the standardization field, uh, there is also another committee which is working on e-health. So maybe a collaboration between uh, our committee and this committee might be fruitful for another standard, which is could which could be specific to uh, to the to the ill health uh, issue. Um, now the main problems that could be addressed by such standard and by possibly patients' organization and structured healthcare structures, is to me is the accessibility of uh, ill health, health tools. Uh, because there, uh, in many countries and in Belgium, for example, the what we call the numeric fracture, which is uh, the difference between people who can manage uh, the digital tools and those who cannot. It's about um, thirty percent of people who just cannot and don't manage to have uh, access to, to such tools. And when it's coming to the health, is be, it becomes really crucial. Uh, otherwise, you may have a, a real. Uh, uh, a real break in the, the, the treatment process. Um, that's one aspect. Um, also another aspect is that uh, e-health tend to, um, to replace some of the, I would say face-to-face -face interaction, uh, for example, with communication, like, like we, we are doing just right now. And when the situation will be um, back to normal, I think it's also important that uh, to consider e-health as one of many options and not the only options for, for the patient uh, that you have to discuss with uh, the patient or to see if he, uh, he or her is okay with it. But if it's not okay, then okay, we we'll go on another direction, maybe uh, more classic, but it's, it must uh, be based on the active communication, whatever the tool you use. Anyone wants to add something about e-health? Paul and Joachim? No, I can relate to what, uh, what Bill Ray has said. Uh, it's important factors. Um, and uh, and uh, like you said, Axel, this, um, this standard can relate to pretty much everything we have done so far. It's just we want to underline that we need to do more of it. Um, and I, I also need to underline that uh, when it comes to culture and values and changing them, uh, the more things we use to try to change it, the better. It's like yeah, it's like a, like a, the, the sky is the limit because, uh, um, yeah. Well, what we know from studies conducted, both completed and ongoing, is that the person-centered approach can be applied only through in, in digital meetings and over e-health devices. And, and it could actually be also kind of supported and facilitated, depending on what kind of structures you build in. And, and so in the development process of e-health, it will be important to apply these principles and, and practices that could support person-centered care. Good. And, and I think that was a good, uh, good, um, yeah. It, it's good to say that uh, that you said it, Joachim, because in the standard we 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 talk a little about e-health and digitalization, but but it's just an, an example uh, because it depends also in in what setting and country and and uh, uh, you are. So, but the, the the central aspect about how to collect and work with the narratives and the documentation and shared decision making of course is something that digital technology uh, surely is a very very interesting aspect uh, for for many patients but but not for all so once again it's it's good to to uh, have the standard that the discussion uh, and and also we have a question about, uh, from um, uh, uh, Maddy uh, Lizaraga about how how do we how could we use the standard now how do we proceed and as I said you can uh, download or or in depending on the country via SEN uh, by the standard and of course you could start 
already using the standard in your institution or hospital or, or primary care center or, or home care, whatever. Um, and then you, you have audits both, you can use internal audits, uh, but maybe you already have accredited um, uh, accreditation for organization that could certify in that sense. And that is one way to also increase the leverage of the standard to work with regions and, and policy make in order to see how the standard can facilitate also uh, improvement and um, uh, in, in the different areas of, of healthcare. Um, one question that is very important and is asked by Christina Radwan is about the role of patient organizations um, in, and how could patient organization use the standard in order to, to, yeah, to, to work with the standard. And um, um, once again, the question goes to, to Bill Ray from Anek and see how you have discussed this as the uh, European Consumer Voice. Well, I would say it's, it would be the same way as we do. So like a lobby tool to improve the patient's uh, experience. But what patients organization have and that we don't have as consumer organization is that you have, you, you have the possibility to directly reach the patients. Uh, for example, if you have uh, many patients that complain that uh, they, kinda, they cannot find their ways in a hospital, for example, uh, you can contact the hospital uh, holding the standard and say, based on patient centered care, it would be a good option to improve that aspect because in that way, the patient would feel better and the care will be better and so on and so on. So you could use it in, in this way. You can use it uh, to inform the patients also to tell them that uh, it's really important for the patient to, to be involved to, uh, to, to, to stand up for their rights, if, the, if it's necessary, to uh, maybe sometime uh, kind of trigger the professional to say, hey, I want, I want to be part of this. I, I don't want be, uh, to, to be passive. And the role of patient's organization is to stand by the patients and to, to, to help them through this process. And Maybe uh, when uh, it's applied somewhere, just to check, okay, if, is everything done okay? Uh, to discuss with the authorities, to discuss with the, the structures and the person who are in charge to, to see how it is applied and how to better apply it, if it's possible. Paul? Yes. Um... Uh, I think that uh, the, the patient organizations, uh, uh, most certainly here in Norway, are, are, um, are complaining a little bit about they don't um, get in the, in the, in, into the, all the processes they should have been uh, invited to, uh, to have their saying. And uh, they uh, first, first of all, the, the the standard can say something about what we have agreed on is a minimal requirement, and there's much there's much learning in that. But they can also go to the the um, institution they want to have a better thing in and say that uh, you should follow this standard and, and and do what it says, and and in that way have a kind of a mean to to see if they can be better involved. Yeah, and certainly it's very important, hopefully very important and useful for patient organizations. But I think also for any kind of stakeholder, the standard could provide a language for what person-centered care is about. And you can, it could be useful for the patient organization in your, your internal work and towards different health organizations and other stakeholders, as well as for, you know, services and organizations in benchmarking, in research, if you want to clarify what, what you want to contribute with a new development, what would be the novel part in, as compared to the, the minimum requirements of person-centered care, for instance. So there are, hopefully useful in several regards. And um, yeah, and, and that's why also the standard has a complete own chapter about patient and public involvement in, in different levels, which I think also will be important. Some countries, we had a question before with different countries, uh, the UK of course has come 
uh, a long way in patient public involvement. Uh, in Sweden, we have uh, started, I would say. So it depends also. So I think that this could be a good, good way to look at it and learn. And I also want to, uh, we got a question from Annette Müller about another standard that is working right now, the ISO standard 304, uh, the care management standard. And, and of course, here I also see, like Joachim was uh, mentioning, there was a bill array before that, of course, it's good to have a synergy and, and work together. So hopefully we can connect also and see how we can, can uh, help also each other with different standards that want to improve the outcome of healthcare uh, in that sense. Uh, some of you also had some problems to, to finding the, the link. And uh, as I said, this uh, meeting has, uh, is being recorded. So uh, when the recording is, is finished and we have uh, texted the, the, the meeting, we will send it out to all the participants, of course, and the, and you different than that. We will also um, in in include the link to the standard from Sen, uh, in that sense, and also the contact information if you want to come in contact with us and have further questions. Um, hopefully, I have uh, we've gone through all the questions. Yes. Um, so now we we have five minutes left. Um, and um, um, I think it's good time to wrap up the, the seminar. So I give the floor back to, to you, Akim, again. Oh, thanks so much. It's been very exciting and, and uh, wonderful to listening to both your, of your experiences from Billy Ray Murray and from the perspective of, of um, your consumer and the European kind of platform for uh, consumer voices and of course also for uh, your examples and experience Pol Polana Edmondson and I I'm actually very happy for for having been part of of uh, and knowing colleagues have been part of facilitating the, the the standard to have it and hope that it will be very useful and important for the continuous development of healthcare across Europe. And certainly there are the context matters and we have very special requirements, like conditions, and, and we are certain you know, organizations and type of healthcare organization and financing and so forth that will influence. But uh, together we hopefully could uh, make significant steps forward. Yeah, so thank you so much for joining us at uh, this webinar and hope to see you again soon. Take care. Thank you.